Good morning. morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. You know, that the scripture that we just read, Luke 2, verses 1 through 14, um, is a passage of scripture that is very familiar to many of us. Uh, We've probably heard it a lot of times. I know personally, um, and Luke, my my grandfather, I remember growing up as a kid, um, all the grandchildren we would gather around for Christmas morning, um, before we would open kit up and presents, and I remember as a kid, I was like so excited, you know, because it's Christmas morning and there's gifts and there's family and then there's food and all these other things are around and you know, and I just I want to eat, I want to open gifts, right, and I want to go play. <laughs> and and I remember my grandfather, he would s- sit around and he had a very he was a slow talker, you know, so he would read Luke two. <laughs> One through fourteen. And I was like, come on, you know, Papa, let's finish, you know. But this is a wonderful passage of scripture for me. When I think about it, I think I think about the amazing part of Jesus in there, but I also think about Christmas mornings as a kid. You know, read it with my grandfather. There's a lot of sentimental things that come to me with this passage of scripture. On a side note, just kind of a fun story. Um, I'm just curious, what was what was like a weird gift that you got for Christmas? Something you're like, what? What is this? I remember one year, um, my grandmother, she got she would all get all the grandkids the same thing, no matter if you were 16 or two, you all got the same thing. So one year, um, she bought us this blanket that would snap up as like a poncho, you know, and so you'd snap it up and it would just like form like a like almost like a onesie type thing, you know, like as like you know, we're like you know, and so then she wanted us to all line up with kids. <laughs> You know, we took a picture of us, and so you see the older ones are just like, really? You know? <laughs> and the younger ones are just like, a blanket, you know? <laughs> the next year, we got a matching pillowcase to go with uh, the blanket. So it was wonderful. The following year, my mom said, why don't I help you? You know? <laughs> Some gifts. So but anyway, so I think of all these passages of Scripture, thinking of my grandfather reading this before we opened the poncho blanket. Um, so this morning... Um, let's go and talk about some amazing things in this. Um, our word for the day that we're going to focus on is love, right, for, for Advent. Um, it was in, I think it's, it's significant for us to think about this. And, um, the, it was the love that, it was in love that Christ came. It was in love that he was born that Christmas morning. And it was in, it is in, was in love that he died on the cross for our sins. And it will be in love that he returns one day. Remember our Advent word of the day as we dig into some powerful truths found in Luke 2, 1 through 14 and discuss reasons for us to give glory to God this Christmas. That's kind of the main thing I want us to focus on is let's find ways to give God glory this Christmas. Um, And I think Luke 2, 1 through 14 really is a great way to kind of remind us of some wonderful truths and we can dig into some things in this. First of all, The first thing, reason we can give God glory this Christmas is because of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And we see that in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Now, the amazing thing about this is this whole census, this decree that came out from Caesar Augustus for people to be registered, um, I just want you to kind of picture yourself in the middle of that circumstance and situation. You can imagine that you're just going through your normal everyday life and all of a sudden you get notice from the government, hey, you need to, at your own expense, pick up and go back to your hometown, where you've come from. Food and all that stuff is going to be your thing and you're going to take care of it and you're going to have to be the one to do all of these things by yourself and, you know, and good luck. <laughs> it's kind of like, it'd be very frustrating. And then, of course, we know, if we, as we know the story, not everybody's going to have a 
a hotel to stay in. There's not going to be some place necessarily comfortable for you to sleep in. You just have to do it. I mean, you can imagine the frustration and the disappointment and the anger and all the stuff that people were probably feeling but couldn't say because the, the, the force of the Roman government had. But amazingly, something that I think went unnoticed probably by some people was that this is the time that Jesus was coming. There can be a lot of disturbance, you know, in our lives, and we don't always recognize that there's a sovereign God that is working behind the scenes to move things along. Amen. He's the one that's working something that, you know, for us it's like uncomfortable. I'm moving back to, my, to Bethlehem, right, <laughs> and going to a place and basically having to pick up my pregnant wife and get on top of a, a donkey and having her go all this long distance, you know, it just seems very frustrating and hard and difficult. But there's a sovereign God who was working. One of the things he was working was that a prophecy could be fulfilled. Micah 5.2 prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So a sovereign God moves a big government, moves um, Caesar Augustus to say, let there be a census, let people go back to where they've been come from so they can be registered. And in the midst of this chaos and frustration, probably, is the time when Jesus came. The sovereign God moves a government sometimes. The sovereign God moves things in our lives that we just don't understand and maybe it can be frustrating at many times. We don't get it. But a sovereign God moves things so that common people like Mary and Joseph can get to Bethlehem and that Jesus can be born and the hope of the world comes through that. We need to trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in the sovereignty of God many times like you know, that moves a big, powerful government to accomplish what he wants. We benefited from him moving people that day. We benefited from the government census that day. Trust in God and believe that he is using powerful people and maybe frustrating circumstances for his glory and for your good. Trust that he will fulfill promises and prophecies. All of them will be fulfilled. Have hope in that today. Sovereignty of God is something that is good for us and something that we can give God glory for this Christmas. The second thing um, that we can give God glory for this Christmas is um, the accessibility of Jesus. How accessible Jesus is. We see this in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Luke 2, 7 says this, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Jesus, who was God in the flesh, was placed in an animal trough and wrapped in strips of clothing like normal babies. Jesus was born not in an inn, not in a nice house, but in a cave that is approachable and accessible to the common man and the powerful man. He wants the rich and the poor to come to him, the common and the powerful to come to him, the significant and the insignificant to come to him. Jesus is accessible to everyone. And if he would have been born in an inn or a nice home or something like that, he is not going to be accessible to everyone. His lowly estate or his mean estate, as Brian so wonderfully told us this morning, it makes him accessible to everybody and that is good news for us. When I think about the accessibility of Jesus, I think of scriptures like Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's accessible to everyone. And that's true within Jesus' life and ministry. To illustrate this, I'm, I'm going to share you one of my missionary stories. Um, it is a privilege for me here um, in America to go to the, the, to the DMV. I loved about a couple years ago when I got to go and get my driver's license here. It took me only 45 minutes. People were polite, they were professional, and everything got done. But I remember in Kenya, it took me weeks to get my driver's license. Weeks to get my driver's license. I remember one particular instance, I had to go to a government office to get some paperwork done, and I stayed in line for eight hours. 
And then they said, oh, you forgot something, come back tomorrow. So I went back and got that particular thing that I was missing, went back, stood in line again for eight hours, and they said, oh, you're missing something else. So I went back and got that something else and stood in line for eight hours, and then they were like, okay, come back in two weeks. I'm like, you know, (laughs) and I needed that paperwork for a work visa. You know, it's one of those frustrating things. But in Kenya, there are ways to get that paperwork quickly. One involves some sin, right? <laughs> so there's bribes. Number two way to get that thing done quickly is you've got to know someone who's powerful and in charge, right? And so you know that if you know that guy who's powerful and in charge, you know he's your buddy and all that, it's great. But the problem with that guy who's powerful and in charge He's not accessible. All right? Oh, you can do this, right? <laughs> so, but he's, he's very, usually he's not very accessible. The reason he's not accessible is because he has armed police guards with machine guns that are guarding his, his office. He also has a special elevator that you have to go on that has a special key that you can't just get from anybody to get up to his office. And, if you, and so, but if you get to him, you'll have that paperwork like this. Because he'll just make it happen because he's got a lot of authority and power. The amazing thing is that the Lord is not like somebody that is guarded by machine guns and a special elevator with a special key. He is accessible to everybody. He is all-powerful, all-knowing in everything, and you have direct access to Him. Him being born, not in the inn, not in a house, being wrapped in swaddling cloth, is something that shows you the humility of the Lord to make Himself accessible to everyone. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and that is good news to us and reason for us to give God glory this Christmas. The third reason that we can give God glory this Christmas is joy. It's for the joy that we see. That we see it in um, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. In eight, verses 8 through 11, it says this. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great Fear. I want to stop there for a second. They were filled with great fear. Now, I can imagine, like, you know, you're just, you're just a shepherd. You're out there tending your sheep, and, you know, there's really nothing that changes in a shepherd's life, right? It's just the sheep go eat the grass, the sheep go to water, and that's it, <laughs> right? Nothing changes. Then all of a sudden, Bang, there's an angel. Bang, the glory of the Lord shines upon you. I mean, I would have been in terror. Right? You're like, what is this? What is this? You know, for a shepherd, it's just the same every day, except this day, something totally different changes. Um, and it says they had great fear. What's interesting, though, about this word, um, great fear, it has the idea of surprise and wonder. It's not just total terror, right? But it's the idea of surprise and wonder. Um, But we can see that the angel tells them to fear not. And the reason is that there is great news of great joy. The good news that he talks, that the angels talk about, is for the whole world, for all people. I think we need to see that in verse 10. It says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the Savior we can see here is born. The good news is for all people, everybody, the whole wide world. The good news is that Jesus was born this day. And so... I think it's significant we can see here there are three titles of this Savior that is born. We see that Jesus is called Savior in verse 11. He is called Christ and He is called Lord. Those are three significant titles that we're given. And those, this child that has been born who is Savior, Christ, and Lord is the one that is to bring us joy in this world. What's significant about these titles is it kind of helps illustrates that Jesus is deliverer. He's Savior, right? Delivers us from sin. Also, number two, 
the Savior, that means he is master. And that he is Christ, that means he is an anointed king. These three titles highlight his mission. He's the Savior. Highlight his royalty. He is the Christ and his authority as the Lord. We highlight all of these things. He's the Savior, he's the Christ, and the Lord. And the good news is that Jesus and all the titles that he comes with bring salvation to all people, regardless of their nationality, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, or economic status. It was his mission to be able to do this because he has the authority and royalty to do so. This is good news that causes great joy and gives us reason to glorify God this Christmas. When you think about Jesus, the Christ, the Savior, the Lord, who was born on Christmas Day, and really, Christmas is just the beginning. It leads us up to Easter, right? And Resurrection Sunday. The whole point of Christmas is Easter, really. And so we think about it, it brings us great joy that there's hope in this world that we, have, we can know the Christ, the Savior, and the Lord. Do you find joy when you think about your salvation? Do you find joy that Jesus came? Think about Him and consider these realities this Christmas, that He's Christ, the Savior, and Lord, and He's for you. You know, as I think about some of the great joy that comes from knowing the Christ, the Savior, and the Lord, um, there's a, uh, I'm pulling out all my missionary stories today. So there's one um, that I found was really incredible. Um, some of, my, some of my staff members in Kenya, there's two guys named Fred and Evans, they're twin brothers. Fred and Evans are two, two twins. And they were um, down in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And they were preaching, they were preaching and talk, teaching a conference of ours. They were talking about salvation. They are talking about Jesus in this one particular part of the conference. And, and in Tanzania, they had this annoying thing, which I personally don't like, but I think the Tanzanians are okay with, is they have these loud bullhorn speakers on the corners of the, of the, the church. And they just blast whatever's being said in the church, outside the church, and it's so loud. But, <laughs> but people are okay with it. So this particular time, Fred and Evans are up there, they're teaching this part of the conference, and uh, a, a woman walks in, and she is um, dressed in um, you know, uh, Muslim-like kind of, kind of clothing. She's wearing a hijab, she's wearing her black clothing, you can just see this one little strip of her eyes, and she's a Somalian woman, which is significant. Less than 1% of Somalians worldwide are Christians. They are one of the largest unreached people groups in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet she walks into this church. And she comes and sits in the back. And after they were done teaching, she comes up and sees Fred and Evans. And she says, you were talking of Jesus. The Jesus that I was hearing about is much different than the Jesus I have been taught about. I want Jesus. This Jesus you were speaking about is good. And I want him. She never heard the this, this, the story of Jesus dying on a cross. You ever heard these truths? Muslims believe that Jesus never died. So that just wipes away the cross, it wipes away the resurrection, it wipes away everything. But now she hears this story told. And she wants Jesus. She wants to know the Christ, the Savior, and the Lord. She received Christ that day with Fred and Evans. She took her hijab off and threw it down on the ground and walked out of the church lifting her hands saying, Praise Jesus. She had great joy that day in the Lord. There's great joy that comes from knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. There's great joy that can come to us because the hope of the world has come. And He came in the form of a child and yet grew as a man and died on the cross for our sins, and became Savior and Lord for us. The fourth reason for us to give glory to God this Christmas is because of peace. Um, I'm going to go from verse 12 to verse 14, but we're going to focus on verse 14. Verse 12 says, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. We see this word peace in verse 14. Peace among those with whom he is well pleased. 
uh, significant for us to pay attention to this, you know, because we think sometimes, well, man, in 2020 is there peace, right? Or in any time of my life is there peace? And we can see that there is peace among those with whom he is pleased. The amazing thing is that peace is available. But according to this passage of Scripture is, among who? Those with whom he is well pleased. We have peace with God by having obedient faith in him. But how do we, how do we please God? Because it says here there's peace only for those with whom he is well pleased. Well, how is that possible? Pastor Nathan preached not too long ago on Hebrews 11, and we had a long series on that. And one of the people we focused on was this man called Enoch. We see in Hebrews 11, verses 5 through 6, um, which is about Enoch. It says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Okay? And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever should, would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So we can see then that peace comes to those, who, with, you know, to those with whom He is well pleased. Well, how do we please God? We please Him according to 11, Hebrews 11, 5 through 6 by seeking after Him. By obeying Him, by having faith in Him. Those are key things. Now isn't it a, a blessing that peace is available? What if there was no peace? What if verses like Luke 2.14 said that there is no peace? That there weren't verses like this? I mean, it's amazing the fact that there is peace that is available with whom God is pleased with. But it comes through those with whom he is well pleased. Look at your life and ask, is God pleased with you? Is your life marked by an, a faith like Enoch's? Walking with God. Living a life of obedient faith. Seeking after him. Do you have faith in Christ? Are you seeking after the Lord? If you do have faith in Christ and are walking with Him in obedience, there is a peace that comes with that. Now, it doesn't mean that all your problems and all your struggles are just wiped away, but there is a peace that comes with walking with the Lord that is unexplainable. And that we can go through hard circumstances and situations and yet still have peace. Let me illustrate this a little bit. My church in Kenya um, is called Ridgeways Baptist Church. There is one of our deacons. His name is William. William's an older man. Um, but I remember when I first came to Kenya, the first month I was there as a missionary, I started going to Ridgeways Baptist Church, and they said, Matt, we're going to do a mission trip with youth. And um, you're, you're a missionary for youth, right? I said, yes, I am. They were like, well, you're coming with us. <laughs> so then the first month... I got on the bus. It was a bus of me and 59 Kenyans, um, young people, and the youth pastor. And we all got on the bus, and we went to the coast of Kenya. We drove like eight hours to get there. And our mission trip there was to paint um, a, a police station. And as we're there, we're going to share the gospel with policemen, some of the prisoners, and the surrounding community as we're painting and serving the policemen. Um, and so William... The the deacon I mentioned, his son was on the mission trip with us. And some of the things that we would do after kind of painting and sharing the gospel and all during the day is in the later afternoons and the evenings, we would go swimming in the ocean because we're on the coast, right? You got to go see the ocean. So we're out there and we go swimming. Well, for those of us who are good Florida people, we know what this is. We know what a undertow is and we know what a riptide is. Um, people who are more landlocked in Nairobi don't really know that. And so we're out there swimming, and all of a sudden we see this riptide rip start pulling some of the young people out, and they're panicking, panicking about how to get back in. I, together with some people, we rescued three young people to get them out of the ocean because they weren't strong swimmers. And in the midst of the chaos of rescuing the three, one slipped away unnoticed, and it was William's 16-year-old son. 
and he drowned. It was tragic. Um, and we, and, there, and, and William, you know, came from Nairobi to the coast and did any, we're looking for a son. It took four days for him to wash back up on shore. That was terrible. And I remember William said to all of us, I want you to continue to preach the gospel. I want people to know Jesus, and I want you to continue with the mission trip. It was hard for us, but we continued. And I remember at the end of the trip, um, you know, the policemen gathered all of us around and um, thanked us for painting the police station. They bought us sodas, and they bought us little, like, they're called Queen's Cakes. They're like, Basically cornbread, right? And, but people love them there. They're, they're really, they, they, you bite them in your mouth and just kind of crumble or just suck all the moisture out of your mouth. It's whatever, you know? <laughs> but they're queen's cakes, right? So they're like, thank you. <laughs> and so William gets up at the end of this kind of police saying thanks to us, and he steps up, and everybody gets quiet. Everybody just is deadly silent because we know this is the man who just lost his 16-year-old son. He steps up and he, he graciously thanks the police for helping him find his son. And he says to them, um, it was, it's been very hard for me to lose my only son who was 16 years old. But I do want you to know that God is good because I had a son. Some people don't have a son. Number two, God is good because I had my son for 16 years. Some people don't have a son for 16 years. And number three, God is good because this is not the end and I will see my son again in heaven. And because of that, I have great peace. And I want to further have, you want you to know that same peace that I have by giving your life to Jesus Christ. And he goes on to share the gospel with them powerfully. Six policemen gave their life to Christ. And if you know anything about Kenyan policemen, that's a big deal. <laughs> a very big deal. And then also, later on, we had the funeral back in Nairobi and had, you know, with the whole church and a lot of other people and family and all came and more than 100 people received Christ through the funeral. And many others from later on down the road through that story. This is an example to where peace is available to those who, with whom he is well pleased. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the hurt. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the pain. But it means that peace is available in the Lord because this isn't the end. And it comes to the hope of Jesus Christ being born on Christmas Day. And this is a reason why we rejoice in the Lord in difficult times and circumstances. And it is a glorious thing to know Jesus Christ because of that. There's a fifth reason that we can give glory to the Lord this Christmas, and it's the word glory. We see that in chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom He is well pleased. This, these two words, glory and peace, we see that in chapter 2, verse 14. What is the connection between glory to God and peace among those with whom He is well pleased? What is that connection? I believe it is this. We receive peace in difficult circumstances because when you get caught up in how glorious God is, you don't really seem to be as interested in the cares of this world. Consider this. As you continue to read from chapter 2, verse 15, down to verse 20, 20 that, that little paragraph below, you'll notice that there's the, the shepherds are there. The shepherds were the poorest of the poor, outcast, really, from society. Shepherds, if you've ever been around like a legit shepherd, they're not the best smelling of people either. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of times I just I don't have much time to shower. And what's the point? I'm with sheep anyways, right? <laughs> so, so the thing is, they're kind of outcast in many ways. But the Bible says in Luke 2, 16, that they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Why? Because they were excited. 
There was glory to God in the highest state. The glory of God shone around them. Exciting things were going on. The shepherds returned back to their shepherd fields where they were, glorifying God and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. After they had seen Jesus and they had met him, the baby, they returned glorifying God and praising him for all they had heard and seen. Now, had anything changed about their life circumstances? No. They were still poor. They were still outcast. They still stunk, right? <laughs> They're still the same. Same kind of guys that they were. But what had changed was that they had got to experience the glory of God. And now some of their circumstances, I'd imagine their, their mentality and all those things were started to change. They returned glory, glorifying the Lord and praising Him. When we really press in and see the glory of God, it is so attractive, so incredible, that it outshines the struggles and challenges that we go through. And that is a reason to give God glory. To illustrate this, I want to talk a little bit about when I first started dating my wife, Kelly. So Kelly is not here this morning. She came last night, um, but... You know, but I, want, I told her I was going to share the story. But anyways, when we first started dating, um, I, I started dating Kelly during a summer term in college at Florida State. And um, during this summer term, um, you know, a lot of people are going home, right? There's like a fraction of the campus is actually there during the summer term, and you kind of end up making different friends, you know, than you normally would. So my friend that, um, that was there, it was my good friend, his name was Ryan Maddox. And Ryan would hang out with Kelly. And, um, her, this, and her roommate named Liza. And I knew Kelly from a distance, and I always thought that she is incredibly beautiful and way out of my league. <laughs> so I would just see her from a distance and just say, mm, it probably will never happen, but man, she's, you know, beautiful. Um, but anyways, I remember we started hanging out. I started hanging out with Ryan, and so we started now becoming, hanging out with Kelly. And, and now I was like, this is great, you know. <laughs> but still, she's out of my league. Well, during this time, I'm taking um, one class, only one class that summer, and it was called financial accounting. Financial accounting it was, at that time, the third most failed class at Florida State. And I failed it. <laughs> that I did not pass it. Uh, financial accounting was just such a difficult course. It was just so tricky the way they set it up. What's kind of funny is the, the, the first most failed class at Florida State was college algebra, which was shocking. I'm not sure what, I think it's just kind of a freshman course and everybody's just whatever. Second most failed class is inorganic chemistry and third was financial accounting. <laughs> <laughs> so I failed, you know, financial accounting. It was so f difficult for me and it was frustrating because the way the course was set up, there was three total grades. There was midterm one, midterm two, and then the final. And the way the professor set it up is if you did better on the final than one of the midterms, then that could count for up to 75% of your grade. If I would have gotten one more question right on the final, I would have passed. So, sadly I didn't. I took it the next semester and I passed. But during this time, I remember the day that I found out that I failed financial accounting was also the day that I had my first date with Kelly. And so I was so excited about having my first date with Kelly that I didn't care at all that I failed financial <laughs> accounting. The glory of God is like that in a lot of ways. You know, you, get, you just get so caught up in how amazing this God is, how glorious this God is, that it outshines the circumstances and situations that you are going through. And that is a reason for us to give God glory this Christmas. That is a reason why we can have peace that surpasses all human understanding. is because of God who is so glorious to us. And connected to this, I also think it's significant that um, yeah, cause I don't want you to think that the glory of God just makes me forget all my challenges. I mean, in some ways it does, but at the same time, I think what it helps is it builds faith. In the sense that if I'm really truly giving God glory, and I'm paying attention to how glorious He is, I start to notice the strength of God, the power of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the 
you know, the sovereignty of God. I start noticing all of these attributes about Him, and I think that builds faith in me to help me also have strength to go through whatever challenges I'm going through. And that can give me peace in the midst of harsh circumstances. So that's a reason for us, I think, to give God glory this Christmas. Is Christ attractive to you? Is God's glory attractive to you? If so, then I think peace is available even in difficult times. I don't want to make light of this because some of us in this, in this room, we could all share a lot of stories of hard things that we've been through. And peace sometimes is something you've got to battle to get. But it is available. It is available. And, and I think in the midst of trials and circumstances, there are elements of the glory of God that you're going to see that are going to illuminate themselves more than other times. And it's a good thing. And I think, too, through this, and I don't really have this in my notes, but I want to say this, even as a body of believers, when we see, well, let me say, when, when I and, and when we see you persevering through the pain and still giving God glory, it encourages us. It really encourages us because it shows us that there's hope. Let's just know that there's something to help, there's something worth to strive for in faith. And so, for that, I want to say thank you to you. I want to encourage you to persevere because you're helping us see God's glory. The last thing I think is important for us to remember, the sixth reason for us to give God glory is Jesus, of course. And Luke verses 2, verses 12 through 14 is it kind of the lead up to this peace among whom he is well pleased. Is the, we see the glory of God. We also see that it's Jesus. It says, and this will be a sign for you, verse 12, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. There's this, it's Jesus, the baby, it is the baby of Jesus, Christ this Christmas, that we can now help be, see the glory of God. You know, because sometimes, you know, we wonder like, you know, it's hard for me. I'm in the midst of a challenge or a difficult circumstance or situation. And yeah, this is glory to God in the highest of peace among whom he is well pleased. And, you know, well, how do I get this peace? And how, how can I see this glory of God to help me find peace in the midst of my difficult challenge? And you see the glory of God through Jesus. I think it's significant the way that that's lined up there, that there's a baby, and then we see glory to God and peace among whom is well pleased. You get to that peace through Jesus. You, 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 get, you see the glory that brings you peace through Jesus. We can see the glory of God really through Jesus Christ. And through the eyes of faith, we see God's glory about through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.3 says this about Jesus. It says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. It is possible for us to catch a glimpse of the glory of God through our spiritual eyes as we read the scriptures and believe what it says about Jesus and as he, and as he exercises his divine attributes and prerogatives, we are by faith getting a look at the divine glory of God. So if you really want to find peace in the midst of this world, you look at Jesus and you see the glory of God. You see him, you see Jesus through faithful eyes as you read the scriptures, know it, study it, love it, get caught up in who he is. That now helps you find peace. And the other thing too is on this element of peace is there is no peace in this world um, because of our sin, really. And there's no peace with God because of sin. And it's through the birth of Jesus Christ who died on the cross that now it is through Him that we can have peace with God. The wrath of God comes on to Jesus Christ for our sins which now then gives us peace with God because the wrath has been fully exhausted on Jesus Christ. Apart 
from Christ coming to help bring us peace with God, we're always at unrest because of sin and its effects. We never, we don't, we we don't, we'll never see God's glory apart from Jesus. We are blind, deaf, dumb, mute. People who won't see it. We don't naturally seek after God. We don't naturally look at the glory of God according to Romans 3. Instead, it takes the person of Jesus Christ for us to see that. The grace of God working through that. And through His mercy. So for the fact that you can even have an opportunity to have peace with God and have peace on this earth is an act of God's divine grace. And for that, we give him glory this Christmas. I think that's important. We see in John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We see the glory of God through Jesus. And it is through Jesus that there is peace with God and peace on earth. There are many reasons to worship God this Christmas. Things may not follow normal Christmas traditions, whether your friends or your family, because of coronavirus. But maybe this Christmas we need to remember the sovereignty of God, the accessibility of Jesus, the joy that comes through knowing the Savior, the Christ and the Lord, the peace that is available to us, the glory of God, and of course, Jesus who made our salvation possible. Take time this Christmas to worship our Lord and reflect on how amazing Christmas is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we say thank you, Lord. We give you glory this morning, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, for your kindness, Lord. Or we do not deserve it. We would never see your glory. We would never have peace available to us if it was not for you in love sending Jesus Christ and giving your only begotten Son. We praise you for that this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty and how you work things, Lord, that we don't always understand, but it is amazing. And for that, we praise you. We love you, Lord. And Father, is anyone in this room today who does not know Jesus Christ and does not have peace with you, I pray, Father, for your mercy to save them and draw them to you. Commit them into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.